morning. We're so glad that you've come to church on this cool Sunday morning. For those of you that are joining us uh, here in the community, around the state, around the world, we just want to welcome you to Van Buren First Assembly. We believe you've made the best choice today and hope that you have come expecting today. I hope that you will open your Bible. I uh, will start in James chapter 4 and then a number of places that we'll be today and you can you can uh, flip on over or actually flip backwards uh, towards Psalm 34 and I'll be there here in just a few minutes. The beginning of the year we started talking as a staff all the way through the building in each service, each class are talking about, about prayer. And we will do that through January, then into February, we will begin talking about family. The theme will be about family. And then in March, we will talk about uh, the five giants in your life. So you don't want to miss a Sunday. And speaking of March, we are headed to Costa Rica on a missions trip in March. Actually, it will be our spring break. I think that's the third week of March. We will leave on that Sunday, the second week of March. 22nd, sorry. And uh, we will leave on the 22nd, and we will return that following Friday. And uh, we have, I believe we have four spots left on that trip. And if you are able, if you have any kind of carpentry skills, um, listen, I'm good at tearing it up, but putting it back together just doesn't work for me. Amen. I can tear some stuff down, but to put it back together is very difficult. And what we will be uh, working on there in Costa Rica is we will be at, we're building a school uh, onto a church. And so our part of the missions trip will be plumbing, electrical, and laying tile floor. And uh, if you have any of those abilities at all, we would love for you to be able to go. We have four spots left. We're taking 20 people, and uh, we're looking forward to that. If you're able to go, you can call the church office, and please please let them, let them know as we need to get you uh, in line for a ticket. We're talking about prayer, and this past Tuesday, actually all the Tuesdays in, in January, we have set aside for a time of prayer. And I'm telling you, I've been the pastor of the church now for a little over four years, and I have not been in two prayer meetings like we have had the past two Tuesday nights. This the first Tuesday, I thought, wow. This past Tuesday when I walked out, I thought, I incredible, absolutely incredible. And uh, there's a reason for that, too, I believe. One is because we're sacrificing our time coming another night of the week and uh, for an hour. And then the other part of that, I believe the reason that the Lord is moving so in those prayer meetings is that every person that comes through the door is here for one thing, and that's to pray. And when folks show up with a like mind to do a certain thing, I'm telling you that God gets in the middle of that. And so this Tuesday will begin at 6, 6 p.m. to 7, and it's a wonderful time. But please, if you're, if you're going to show up to look at your phone and play on your phone, you're in the wrong meeting. Uh, if you came to socialize and all those kind of things, I'm just telling you my job, part of my job as a pastor is to protect the things that go on within the flock. And so I'm very protective of the prayer meeting because God's doing something for folks that will show up with a like mind. That meeting changes all other meetings. I said that prayer meeting changes all other meetings. And so I'm telling you it was incredible. This morning I said last week, let me get you back to where we stopped. If you put a million dollars, if I put a million dollars in your bank account, you're guaranteed a millionaire. But if you don't know how to write a check, that which is guaranteed to you cannot be enjoyed. And too many of us who have got bank accounts full of God's blessing are forgetting to sign our check. We forget to draw from that spiritual reservoir or we don't understand how to draw from that spiritual reservoir to live the successful Christian life. In James chapter 4, verse 2, the Bible said, You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask amiss. Or this translation I'm reading from says, You ask with wrong motives that you, that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. So the scripture said, therefore, in James, you do not have 
because you ask with the wrong motive. And when you get what you get, you spend it on yourself. For many of us, or for many of us, prayer is like the national anthem at a football game. It gets us started, but simply has no connection with what's happening on the field. Prayer is simply a courtesy. In Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, the Bible said, The Lord said, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. The Lord said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 8 through 9, these are the words of Jesus. He said, the people, these people come near me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain with their teachings that are merely human rules. Last week we started talking about the requirements, the requirements of prayer. And we said number one last week that prayer is required to be forgiven. In Psalm chapter 32 verse 1 through 6 that is explained there. I won't go back and read it. There are many other verses that allude to the fact of prayer and forgiveness. But we said last week from Psalm chapter 32, verse 1 through 6, that there were three things found there in order to be forgiven that comes through prayer. And one was acknowledgement, that we must acknowledge that we are wrong. We must acknowledge that he is the Lord of lords, the King of kings. Two, in verse 5 of Psalm chapter 32, we saw that there was confession, is that I must confess my sin to the Lord. And then the third thing we saw in verse 5 was that through acknowledgement and through confession came forgiveness. I want you to know this morning that the greatest miracle that could ever be performed is for God to forgive somebody of their sin. You want to see a modern day miracle? Turn your head to the left or turn your head to the right. If someone that's sitting beside you or close to you that their name is written in the Lamb's book of life, then you are looking at a modern day miracle. Yesterday, in a funeral service of all things, we had 15 people gave their life to Jesus Christ in a funeral service. If the man had got up and walked out of the funeral, out of that coffin, it would not have been a greater miracle Miss Hope I know we would love to see that but yesterday I want you to know Hope that your son's death was not in vain because 15 people yesterday new names written down in the Lamb's book of life what the enemy means for evil God will turn into good can somebody say amen if you can't shout or clap about 15 people giving their lives to Jesus at a funeral service If you just simply tell people the truth, if you just simply give people an opportunity, 15 names written down in the Lamb's book of life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, the Bible said, listen to this, and listen to this, you church e people. For godly sorrow. For godly sorrow, Paul said. I'm not sure today in the church we've reached godly sorrow. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Listen to me this morning. I'm speaking to somebody this morning because I didn't write this particular scripture down till just before I came out of here and felt the need to talk about this to somebody in the room. For you that is sitting this morning, you're on the fence. You're here today because your parents invited you. You're here today just out of some moral obligation. You feel, you feel that you need to be in church. Listen to this preacher for just a moment as to what Paul was saying Here in this scripture, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. 
In other words, a godly sorrow that drives you to change your attitude, that drives you to change your behavior, that drives you to change things about yourself will never be regretted. I do not regret the day, Brother Steve, that I slid up out of that seat and walked down that aisle and had godly sorrow for the things in my life and I gave my life to Jesus Christ and 20 years later today, I am not sorry for that. I am not ashamed for that. In fact, I'm more on fire for God and ready to obey Him today than I was on that day. That is what godly sorrow produces. Not to be regretted. But the sorrow, listen and I'll move on. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation. There in that scripture refers to the sorrow of our sins that results in changed behavior. That's what godly sorrow is. When you have a godly sorrow, you will not want to just hop in bed with anybody that walks by. When you have a godly sorrow, you'll pay your tithes. When you have a godly sorrow, you will use the talent that you have in your life. When you have a, come on, I'm preaching good already. When you reach the point of godly sorrow, you don't want to walk out the way you walked in. You don't want to go back and face that old man. There must be a turn. Listen what repentance means. I know it's old fashioned. I know you've heard enough of it, but the people that are in that funeral yesterday heard about repentance. It's a change of behavior it's not talking like I've always talked it's not I'm sorry I'm talking to churchy people sorry churchy people sorry godly sorrow will change you godly sorrow doesn't make you look at pornography when everybody's gone godly sorrow doesn't make you run, jump in the closet, closet drinker. Godly sorrow when you're halfway around the world on vacation by yourself. I had a lady one time in church, not here, but came and asked me, she said, Pastor, isn't everything off limits when we're more than 50 miles from the church? We were a commuter church. What do you say? No. It's not off limits. It's not off limits 50 miles away. It's not off limits 50 foot away. This is a relationship with Jesus Christ 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's a, it is a godly sorrow that I am not regretful for. Man, that's good. You'll change your behavior when you have godly sorrow. You won't want to sin. You won't want to do wrong. You won't want to sleep around. You won't want to... Well, churchy people, let me keep going. Many people are sorry only for the effects of their sin for being caught. Many people are sorry only for the effects of their sin or for being caught. That is worldly sorrow the scripture is talking about that produces death. That's not what godly sorrow produces. Godly sorrow, I'm spending time here, I want to teach you. Godly sorrow drives you to repentance or changed behavior. Worldly sorrow is just mad because they got caught. It produces death. Listen to me. Compare this morning Peter's remorse and repentance with Judas's bitterness and act of suicide. Both disowned Christ 
However, one repented and was restored to faith and service, and the other killed himself. Godly sorrow drove Peter to a point of repentance. He had godly sorrow and he was restored to faith and victory in his life while Judas, while Judas sin drove him to a worldly sorrow which caused him to make a selfish exit and kill himself because he did not want to prayer am I preaching good? Prayer is required for forgiveness. Number two, prayer is required to develop an intimate relationship with God. Now don't let perversion jump in your mind. Intimate means closeness. Prayer, that's one of the reasons why Tuesday night God comes down in the middle of it because there are folks there that are intimate with God. They are close to God, so therefore he comes down. For the believer, all intimacy is born out of trust. I am close to God because I trust God. I trust this morning that he's my healer. I trust that he is my savior. I trust today that no matter what may be coming my way this week, that he is bigger than those issues I may face. He's bigger than cancer. He's bigger than poverty. He's bigger than an addiction. Come on, somebody. I trust God. Why do I trust God? Because I've been close to God. And when I get close to God, I I understand that greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. I know today he's not going to let me down. I know he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll never turn my back on you. Your husband may walk out, but God will never walk out. Your best friend may leave, but he's a friend that sticks closer. Man, that's good preaching. I just want to know this morning, if you can't clap your hands, I want to know, do you know him? Do you know who I'm talking about today? Or is he just a name to you? Is he just a story to you? But I'll tell you this morning, I feel like preaching. I thought I'd stop by to tell Van Buren First Assembly this morning that he's more than just a name. He's more than a character. He's my friend. He's my father. He's my deliverer. His name is Jesus. For 15 people sitting in a funeral yesterday, for those of you that have sat around on a pew way too long, you churchy people, you can't get excited. But 15 people in a funeral home yesterday raised their hand and met a God that you have gotten used to. You have gotten used to God. You've gotten used to your salvation that was so freely given to you. Now, you take it for granted. Preach me up out of my pew, I dare you. Oh, we won't get you up. Don't worry. But I know 15 folks yesterday. I told them after we prayed for them, I said, listen, I've never done this at a funeral. I felt the Holy Ghost yesterday. In fact, I was having myself a time. I was sorry my time was over. (laughs) Because they were holding on. It felt like they were holding on. They were. People have no hope today. What I'm trying to give you today is hope. Hope of a better future. Hope that you don't have to live depressed. Hope that you don't have to aimlessly wander around. It's hope. It only comes out of a closeness with God. Number three, I haven't even got where I stopped. Number three, prayer is required to maintain purity. Well, now, where's all the shouting now? 
can we just talk this morning? One person said, I can. Well, I'm just sowing my wild oats. Well, I'm just having fun till you know, I'm ready to make a change. Prayer is required for purity. Hmm. Number four, prayer is required to walk in faith. Faith is a very important component of the life of a believer and should be because Hebrews chapter 6, I'm chapter 11, verse 6, the Bible said, For without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. I won't spend time here. We did last Sunday, and I'll get on to point number five, which is where we're starting this morning. But I want you to hear this. The level of faith a believer is capable of attaining depends on how he goes about exercising his faith. I said the level of faith that a believer is capable of having depends on how he goes about exercising his faith. This morning when you returned your tithes and offerings, that took faith. If you didn't return it, you have no faith. This morning if you slip up and come out of your pew and you come down and you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, that takes faith. The more you exercise your faith, the more you exercise that depends on how much faith you will grow in. No prayer, no faith. No faith, no miracles. We want to see miracles in the modern day church. I don't know about you, but I do. I want to see not only people get saved, but I want to see cancers fall off. I want to see diabetes healed. I want to see the blind see and the deaf hear and the mute speak. If he said that we would see it, then by all means, honey, might as well just happen in this church. But it's going to come through prayer. And prayer has faith. And faith has miracles. The reason we're not seeing miracles today in the modern day church is we are faithless because we are prayerless but not in this church we're going to be a people of prayer would you just clap and just fake it for a second just would you do that the exercise let's stop here I still feel a little bit of that Where's the miracles? Come back tonight. I'm going to talk about the power of prayer. Where's miracles? Oh, well, quit that, Pastor. That only happened when they sang the old songs. Now, Pastor, you stop that. You're not old enough to remember. You, do, you know miracles only took place under the tent down on the street corner at the Brush Arbor. Those are the only times miracles. Who said? If I read the scripture right, it said he's the same God today as he was yesterday, and he's the same God tomorrow. So where are the miracles? I'll tell you where they are. They're in a storehouse in heaven, and God's soldiers are standing there ready to release those miracles. But he's looking for a group of people that will be deserving enough, hungry enough, and starving for those miracles to happen. That's why we're not seeing them. You had a warm, dry place to sleep so why pray you had a nice car to come to church in so why pray you've got 25 bottles of medicine in the cabinet so why pray I'll tell you when you pray you pray when you get desperate when your child is lost and undone you'll come to a place of des- we're not desperate enough we're spoiled rotten in America. You just keep living because they're after everything you've got. They want you to go work for them and turn your check over to them. Oh, Pastor, not in Van Buren, Arkansas. Number five. And so I have a smiley face right here on my paper. (laughs) Number 
five. Prayer is required to walk in freedom. We live in a world today that is in bondage on many fronts. I said we live in a world prayer is required to walk in freedom. We live in a world today that is in bondage on many fronts. Just go to the store. Just go to a public place and look around and you'll see bondage and strongholds everywhere in front of you. Come to church because a lot of the bondages that are in the world are in the church. Listen, the church is not here for the culture to influence us. The church is here so that it would influence the culture. We are to not look like the culture. We are to be changing the culture. But we have let so many strongholds into the church today. Come on, I'm gonna preach it whether you clap or not. We got drinking saints. We got sleeping around saints. We got smoking saints, we got mad saints, we got unforgiven saints, the church no longer looks separate from the world it looks just like the world local church right here right around us playing ACDC in their lobby when you come in the front door Pastor, you just heard that. No, I didn't hear it. I saw it. Well, you don't, you don't get that, son of me. People are grappling with addictions and phobias of all kinds. And sadly, the bondage of believers oftentimes mirrors that of the world. But these things can be broken through the power of prayer. Let me read to you. I understand you can read, but the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I don't trust you at all. Go read this, so let me read it to you. (laughs) Psalm 34 tells you about freedom. Can I talk to to you for a second? You don't have to live in sin. You don't have to go out and have relations outside of a marriage to be happy. You listen, ladies, you well. You're more than a notch on another guy's belt. God created you for something better than that. Stop letting the devil use you. If he's not somebody you want to marry, then by all means you come and ask God to forgive you. Guys, stop treating ladies. Well, you won't get that in the ACDC church. Psalm 34, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. The psalmist wrote and said, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. It doesn't say he delivered me from a few fears. He delivered me from all my fears. Those, the Bible said in verse five, those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Oh, taste, verse 8 says. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed, blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Verse 9. 
Verse 11, come, my children, and listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue for evil, from evil and your lips from lying. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them on the face of the earth. For the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from some of their troubles. No sir and no ma'am. He delivers them from all their troubles and saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles but the Lord, hey, I said the Lord delivers them from them all. He protects all his bones, not when he will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked, the foes of the righteous but the Lord redeems his servants and no one can condemn who's condemned will take refuge. If I can put that down to the good people in a nutshell, what that saying is, if I cry out unto God, he'll set me free from all my difficulties and all my struggles. Somebody ought to shout. He's not a psychiatrist. It's not a program. It's called the name of Jesus. It's not a pill. It's not a shot. It's not a program. His name is Jesus. Why don't you say his name? Jesus. Ooh, when you can't say anything else, my God, my God. You have no reason but your own to live under what you're living under. Because he died that I may be free. You have, it's your own choice for you to be depressed. It's all your own choice for you to be defeated because there's power in the name. The Bible said at a mention of his name, every knee shall bow. It's fo foolish, ain't it? Foolishness. Foolishness, isn't it? I told a funeral full of standing room only. I've only been at another funeral, one other that I remember like that. A young man was killed in a car wreck. High school young man in a previous church I pastored. When we, we it was at a church, when we got to the church, you could, I, I, you could not get another person in the room. They were sitting on ice chests full of beer on the front parking lot of the church. They had kegs of beer sitting out on the parking lot of that church. That church, you couldn't stuff another person in that room. Yesterday, you couldn't stuff another person in that room. And I'm going to tell you just like I told them church people. It don't matter whether you want to believe it, whether you do believe it or you've put it off. The return of Jesus Christ is imminent and today is the day that you should make yourself right. Doesn't matter what you think about it. Don't matter how mad you're about it. Don't matter what you think it ought to be. Don't matter. He's not going back and rewriting his book just because you don't want to cooperate. Not going to happen. It's not going to happen. There's a few things that you see here in this scripture that I just want to point out to you. In verse 4, we see that, the, that he delivers us from our, all our fear. In verse 6, you see that he saves us in times of trouble. There's, in verse 7, you see that he'll guard and deliver you. In verse 8, you'll see that, he, that he's good to those that trust in him. In verse 9, we see that he supplies all of our need. In verse 15, we see that he hears us when we pray. In verse 22, we see that he redeems us. What else do you want? How do you receive that? How do you get there? Go back and read Psalm 34. It tells you the entire redemptive plan in a few verses. How do you get there? Verse 6 and 17, by crying out to him. Verse 8, through trusting him. 
verses 7 and 9, through fearing him. There's a good old, old sermon for some of you young guys or other guys. The church has lost its fear of God. We don't care anymore. We, we, well, I feel the anointing on that. We don't care. We only care about the things we want to live with. Uh, with. The only things we want to pick and choose to do. The rest of it, we're no longer afraid. There's no fear of God. We talk about the preacher. We do divisive things. We don't walk in obedience like Deuteronomy. And we don't care because we have no fear. We have no fear of a holy God. We have no fear that quite possibly, maybe fractionally, just a little bit, that that preacher might be right about what he's saying. There's no fear of that anymore. Let me just ask you a question for those of you that that may be your thoughts. What if I'm right and you're wrong? Better yet, what if you're right and I'm wrong? Well, guess what? I just lived a good moral life. I didn't smoke and kill myself before it's time. I didn't drink myself into the grave. I didn't sleep around and get every disease known to man and kill myself before it's time. I was good to my wife. I was good to my kids. I was a productive citizen. I got up. I went to W-O-R-K and I paid my T-A-X-E-S's. I did what I was supposed to do and I died a good man if you're right. But if I'm right and you're wrong I die and go to heaven and you die and go to hell. Which one would you rather set on a balance? How do you get those things? Verses 6 and 7, crying out to him. Verses 8, trusting him. Verses 7 and 9, fearing him. Verses 13, all this is in Psalm 34. Verse 13, refrain from lying. Verse 18, humble yourselves. Verse 18, serving him. That's how you get to that place. Listen to me this morning. I got read. I got read all over this where I wrote myself more notes and all that. That's not good news, is it? Listen to me this morning. God promises great blessings to his people. But many of those blessings require our active participation. I said there are blessing upon blessing upon blessing. This book is full of blessing upon blessing upon blessing. But it requires active participation. If I'm going to get the blessing of God, then I must actively participate in what he said for me. And when I actively participate, I use my gifts, I use my talent, I use my money, I use my life. And I actively participate, then the blessing. Here's, here's what most church people are doing today. I'm here. I'm here. Bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And we do nothing. We don't give. Listen, it's about to be spring. Anybody plant a garden? Well, then who is it that's bringing me all this stuff? Just you two, thank you for doing that. Anybody plant a garden? Good, good. Anybody plant flowers? Anybody fertilize your yard? Come on, y'all. What all we got to do here? Anybody do that? Okay. How many of you now, question number two, do you go out and you just put the seed in the ground and you say, well, I'm done, that's it? How many of you go and sow the ground just bust the ground up, look at it, say, man, that's pretty dirt. <laughs> and just go on the rest of the summer and you never put anything in the ground. If you don't sow anything, you can't expect anything back. 
You're sitting here today expecting God to do everything under the sun and you have nothing in the ground. You want God to deliver you. You want him to heal you. You want him to bless you. And you have sown absolutely nothing. But let me tell you, for those that have got some seed in the ground, Pastor Gary, because you put seed in the ground a long time ago, look at the fruit of what's here. Look at the fruit of what's here because you sowed a long time ago. There is a harvest. I said that. There's a harvest, and if you don't have anything in the ground, you have no expectation. Don't expect anything. Don't, ex- oh, I'm sorry, I got on the altar, though. Sorry. If you don't have anything in the ground, then you cannot expect something. But when you have sown in tears, you have sown in your talent, then I have the right to stand back and say, God, I've sown, I've cried, I've planted, and now I want to reap a harvest. We have too many people sitting around expecting stuff you never planted. Well, God ain't blessing me. You don't even own a tiller. (laughs) Let me go over here. These people are mad at me over here. It's something I'll tell you when you, Holy Ghost, you know, this is the anointing. We'll blame all this on the anointing. When it lifts here in a minute, you know, I don't know, but you can feel when people don't like it. <laughs> you can feel it. I know, I know exactly. You want every Pastor, you mad. I'm not mad. I'm passionate. Because I know this to be true. You want every, you God heal my husband, God heal my wife, and you have nothing in the ground. Heaven is not responsible for you or obligated to you when you have nothing in the ground. (laughs) Pastor, that's mean. I didn't write it, he wrote it. Go take it up with God. Malachi, he said, I'm the Lord and I change not. Whew, that was good, you write that down. (laughs) You want everything under the sun, you don't even own a tiller. Or here's some of it. We got all the modern day equipment stuffed over there in the in the shed, but we don't want to put out the effort to make it work. Brand new Troy built tiller. Sitting right there in the shed. And you sitting in the living room out there looking at it. Much as I paid, it ought to run itself. <laughs> Much as I give to that church, that preacher ought to do praying for me. <laughs> you cannot. Please don't sit there and think I'm talking about the new person that just got here this morning. Don't shove that off. I'm talking to every single one of you. Every one of us. Heaven is not obligated to you if you have nothing in the ground. Bet you don't hear that over there either. In this instance, our, particip- our participation is a consistent prayer life. What's my, particip- my active participation? My active participation is my prayer life. Prayer is a requirement of living an overcoming Christian life. 
Prayer is a requirement. The reason that this meeting feels like it does. I don't know about you. I don't know if you brought your Holy Ghost with you, but I brought mine with me, so I feel him in the room. You know why? Because folks gathered on Tuesday night and paid a price, and because they paid a price this morning, we're able to enjoy. If you want to have an overcoming life, and you want to rise, hey, you want to rise above all your mess, then you better get to praying. If you want to rise above cancer, then you better get to praying. If you want to be victorious, you want to be free, and you want to have a marriage you should have, you better get to praying. Prayer is a requirement of living an overcoming Christian life. I hope we, I hope to live free. If I hope to live free, then I must be, we must be a people of prayer. Ooh, here's the last one. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to stop on this one. And I'll pick the other one up tonight, which, by the way, is the last one in this part. Ooh, I've been waiting on this one all morning. Let me get set here. I don't know about y'all, but it's hot up here. I'm just tell you, I ruin a suit every Sunday. The dry, I wish one of y'all would open a dry cleaners. We pay a nice car payment in dry cleaning, right, Pastor Gary? Ooh, let me catch my breath. Y'all play that piano? Do you know how to do it? You do? No, I'm not talking about play. I'm talking about play when I get to going. You know how to do that? You know how to do that? Huh? Okay, let's see if you do. Come out here. We're tragically wide around here. I said we. And in the last days they shall all be offended. (laughs) Get over it. Go to Lowe's, buy yourself a ladder and get over it. Yeah. Well. Hmm. Prayer is required to persevere. If I'm going to be a person of perseverance, then I must be a person of prayer. I just thought I'd tell you this morning what persevere means. To persevere means to continue in a course of action, even in the face of difficulty, or with little or no prospect of success. I want to be a person of perseverance, so therefore I am a person of prayer. What's perseverance? Perseverance is continuing, somebody say continue, in a course of action, even in the face of difficulty. What that means is I, in the face of difficulty, I, I just keep praying. In the face of difficulty, I persevere. I keep moving forward. In the face of cancer, I just keep praying. In the face of poverty, I just keep praying. I just keep praying. Persevering, I just even though the doctor said this, I persevere. Even though the lawyer said this, I contend. Even though they say the church is not going to make it, baby, I keep moving forward. They told me four years ago, you'll close Van Buren First Assembly. Well, look around, baby. There's people here you never thought would be here. There's people serving today you never thought would serve. Look around, honey. There's been people saved. There's been people filled. There's been people delivered. Look around, baby. Because I said, because we are a people of perseverance in the face, in the face, in the face of difficulty. We, I said, I said we move forward. Woo, somebody ought to shout. I said, hey, somebody ought to shout. 
Come on, play it. Turn it up a little bit, Parker. We're Pentecostal. We can handle it. I said we persevere. When you say we can't, God says we can. When the doctor says you can't, God says you can. When the devil tells you you can't, that's a good sign. God is gonna show up. Your bank account says you can't. But the blessing of God says you can. Then your neighbor says you can't. But the devil, I said the devil is a liar. I just thought, I just thought I'd tell all you naysayers that's out there secretly watching when you said we can't look at what God I said just look at what God has done when the doctor said he was going to take your life when the enemy thought he was wiping you out look at what God did when they thought he took your house brother Jared you got double baby for your trouble portion in the room if you need to go you go ahead and go but we're going to actively participate in what God has for us I feel a double portion in the room for your trouble God's going to give you back double God gave Job back double for his trouble and I speak this over this congregation for our trouble God is going to give us double for the trouble in your house. I speak devil. I speak devil. I speak devil. I speak devil over your household. Let me just serve notice on hell just for a minute. Satan, I give you no place. Satan, we give you no place. Every stronghold, every sickness, every doubt, every worry, I release the blessing. I release the blessing, the blessing of God in this. Lift your hands and receive it. Come on, lift your hands and receive it. Lift your hands and participate. Shout, I receive it. I receive it. Tell the devil to give it back. Come on, we're going to go to the enemy's camp this morning. I said we're going to the enemy's camp. We're getting back double your joy, double your money, double your happiness. Come on, church, let's go. something this morning I challenge you slip on out of your pew and come on down here into this double river in this double blessing come on come get it this morning you will have as much of God as you want this morning you'll have as much of him as you want come on y'all see come on don't slow down yet. to the enemy's camp don't slow down and I took back what he stole from me well I
feeling Everything's gonna be alright Whatever you're going through 